Bergson and the Holographic Theory of Mind, Part 55. We're going to look at free will one more time, a big picture, a larger picture, because fundamentally we're going to be looking at the total picture created by time and free will, matter and memory, and creative evolution, which is the source of free action that created the coming of the universe. In this, we'll be looking at physics, Sabine's story, the illusion of causality in physics, and where the story told by Sabina actually fits. So since my first discussion of Bergson and free will, number nine, we've been through aspects of creative evolution in 46, 47, and 49. And much of this, I think, if you go back through 49, you're going to see. And Sabine came along, which we discussed at least a bit. In truth, the time and free will, matter and memory, creative evolution, can be seen as one vast dissertation on free will. And this is a brief look at the big picture and where Sabine fits. Sabine, we saw, was an unadulterated Laplacian. Everything is and has been determined since the Big Bang. End of story. In other words, the little picture there, the universe is pre-programmed, pre set on its path by starting conditions, playing itself out. No room for variation or free choice. Life's not even a road, it's a railroad track. Oh, and the brain, same thing. Just more deterministic billiard balls inside. This is where Sabine's conception fits within Bergson's framework of thought. This corner with a magnifying glass. In this framework, we've seen that the field is taken as holographic, universal field transforming indivisibly, Objects in their motions are actually transfers as a state within the global motion of the whole. The brain, a modulated reconstructive way specific to a source within the field at a scale of time. And time itself is a force. Creation is unceasing, proceeding from the inextensive to the extensive, that is, to the extended space of matter. And therefore, a treatment that works to extend that is a treatment via the geometric relations of inner solids, which is to say the classic metaphysic as well, the 3D point continuum, where the fourth dimension is simply the time of instance corresponding to points along that progression of the object's path, which in reality is an ideal limit, never reached in the thrust from the in inextensive to the extensive. So let's unpack this a bit more. I noted that Sabine, or Sabina, as she prefers to be called, wandered into this argument, to quote. I should like to add that I am not saying something new. Look at the writing of any philosopher who understands physics, and they will acknowledge this, that is, the Laplacian vision. But some philosophers insist they want to have something called free will and have tried, therefore, to redefine it. For example, you may speak of free will if no one was able in practice to predict what you would do. So underneath this little paragraph is this billiard ball vision yet, but the billiard balls, things in that mess there get too complicated, so we can't predict. Nevertheless, we know it's all determined. And underneath this, the misconception of the nature of time. In time and free will, Bergson had pictured this argument already. A philosopher, I use Mr. Dennett, Dr. Dennett, needs to decide between two lines. He spent his life traveling from point O to point D. Now he oscillates, deciding like a pinball at D, deciding, then travels down the route to the Burgundy. A free will decision? The determinist would say, looking at the pinball, oscillation at D, well, he sees a form of mechanical oscillation at D then says the antecedent causes explain the path. So we've got the balls rolling down, mechanical oscillation, bam. The free will guy, both paths were possible. Ignore the path actually taken. In effect, move Dr. Dennett back to D. That is, ignore the demon. Bergson, both are wrong. And why? Both are accepting that physics concept of a, of a mechanical cause is coherent. It is not. 
It's based upon an incoherent conception of motion, a confusion in the concept of force, a confusion on causality. Start with motion. The development, the becoming, the motion of the self, or Dr. Dennett, or all of us, is equivalent to a line in space going down to the burgundy. The line is conceptually divisible, as we've seen, into a series of segments, ultimately a series of points. Ultimately, then, we're talking the basis for the classic metaphysic, that abstract space, three-dimensional points, thus positions, the fourth dimension of the space corresponding to instance, each then to corresponding to the successive positions of an object, instance, the fourth dimension of that space being time, the time of instance. This is already a logical problem, an infinite regress between each pair of static points. We must reintroduce the motion. Else we have no motion, we have just static points, which again, between those two points, it's got to be treated as a line, ad infinitum, or infinitum. This is the base problem we saw Bergson note of Zeno and his paradoxes. Motion is treated in terms of an infinitely divisible space. In truth, motion is indivisible. Achilles' steps are indivisible. He most certainly catches a tortoise. Now the points are conceptualized as states. Same thing. States also apply to the computer model, the computer metaphor of mind, the robotic metal metaphor of mind. That is, the mentality, the operations are states. States by state, instant by instant, discrete states. But each state is supposed to cause the next, because a cause must be repeatable. A cause must be repeatable. You have the cue in the exact same alignment with the one ball, the exact same force applied, you're going to get the same result over and over. But nothing truly repeats. There's only a practical repetition, only practically. In truth, the cue is not the same. The ball is not the same. I'm hitting the same note, so to speak, on the piano, but the finger is not the same. The key is not the same. The string is not the same from time to time. This is only so in this abstract time of this classic metaphysics of motion. Again, the states are repeatable in the computer model only because they're totally abstract. Again, where the entire universe in this metaphor, this metaphysic is conceived at an instant. Each state of the universe, a cube there, a cube being the all of space, the universe, each state corresponds to a state of the universe, a cube. With the time extent, each of those cubes, ultimately in limit of a mathematical point. That is, there is no time at each point. But having done so, taking the cube down to this mathematical point in time extent, we have utter homogeneity. The cubes are utterly homogeneous, stripped of quality, thus repeatable because of the abstractness. So this works but only practically and only for inorganic systems, where in the inorganic system, the present state, that is instant again, depends on the previous instant. And change simply becomes the rearrangement of elements, totally repeatable, reversible. And as a system, each of these is taken as isolated, isolated from the transformation of the holographic field or the universal field as a whole. Now note, nothing is created in this, in this type of motion, a simple rearrangement of elements. Now as an isolated system, the position of its points is determined by the position of the same point at the previous instant. Thus, each previous instant determining the next, and thus by equations with, with coefficients, ds dt, dv dt, etc where ds dt is a small change of distance, ds, relative to a small change of time. But this becomes the question, does the state of a living, that is organic body, not inorganic, find its complete explanation in this state immediately before? Remember this being the principle of deterministic non-free will. 
a guy up there, presumably a, a living being, making that choice, an inner, uh, an organic being. Does this description apply? Well, what does it mean to say that the state of an artificial system depends on what it was at the moment immediately before? Well, the instant or state immediately before is connected with the present instant by the interval dt, that tiny interval. So the present state is defined, as we said, by equations with differential co coefficients, ds dt, dv dt. That is, by present velocities and present accelerations. Thus, a present considered along with its tendency, but just a static present with this hypothetical abstract tendency. So the system science works with are in fact in an instantaneous present that is always being renewed, as Bergson says. When the mathematician calculates the future state of the system at time t, there is nothing to prevent him from supposing that the universe vanishes from this moment till that and suddenly reappears. So at each state of the universe corresponding to the position of that billiard ball as it moves across the point continuum, well, we can have the space one disappear and magically space two appear and then space three appear, while well, space two disappears. In other words, the universe can vanish from this moment till that and suddenly reappear. Nothing prevents this. In fact, it's logically forced in this conception. It's only the tieth moment that counts. This is a mere instant. It's not the interval or the flow, rather the end of the interval. The scientist divides the interval to the infinitely small parts, the little dt's, every interval, the parrot flowing around, the end of the interval where his tail strikes the post. And we divide that into a series of smaller intervals that flow. And we're computing the accelerations, velocities, that is, tendencies. But this is still static moments, not the flowing time. And the tendencies are merely abstract tendencies within the instantaneous instant. That is, we have a series of such extremities or ends of intervals. That is, ends, terminal ends of flows, which are now instants or states. For Bergson, the world of the math mathematician is a world that dies and is reborn at every instant. The world which Descartes was thinking of when he spoke of continued creation. Remember, Descartes Viewing that picture said we have to have God. This word of God has to come in to create each successive state of the universe. So physics fools itself. It cannot escape continuous creation by this artifice. This instantaneity is an abstract limit, never reached. This isolation is an abstract limit. Neither is reached in the concretely transforming universal field. No system is in fact isolated from the indivisible global transformation of the field. Now, when we say depends on, what does it mean that the state of an artificial system depends on what it was at the moment immediately before? We're saying, in fact, it's caused by, it's caused by the next state. The cause equals some force applied to the next state. Force is considered to impart motion to objects, to billiard balls. Each state of the ball is pushed to the next state by some force. Cube one, similarly, same thing, must be forced, become, to change to cube two because those cubes are static, fixed, frozen. They have no time extent. They cannot change. Some force is necessary to push cube one to cube two to get state after state of the universe. But this is the question, is the force of physics capable of acting as a cause? It would have to be an absolute. It cannot be relative. That is, it cannot become a non-force on change of perspective. The force driving this change, in other words, must be absolute. It cannot simply go away uh, on change of perspective or you don't have any transformation of the universe, universal field. This is the problem, physics force 
is entirely relative. In the mathematical framework of physics, remember, motion is change of position. The object can move apart across the point continuum, or the continuum move beneath the object. Motion is relative. It's either rest or movement, depending on perspective, or which is to say, depending on the movement of the coordinate system. But force is tied to this relative motion. F equals ma, force equals mass times acceleration. That is, it is a function of acceleration. Now remember, velocity is the rate of change of position. We're back to the change of position, entirely relative. And acceleration is simply the rate of change or the rate of change of position. Force is therefore inextricably tied to the change of position. It is relative. It cannot be absolute in physics framework. Another way of putting this, this is physics lack of any actual ontology. So the mechanical force less cause framework of physics implicitly invoked by Sabina in her billiard ball model is logically inconsistent. It cannot explain action or real motion that is not purely relative motion, free or otherwise. Remember, real motion, organic continuous transformation that cannot be relativized, the organic growth of a tree, the organic unfolding of a rose. Neither, none of these motions can be relativized, nor either that, for that matter, the lifting of the coffee cup or an organic motion, or the organic development of that storm in the background, the storm front. The whole storm front is an organic simultaneous whole that cannot be relativized to include the supposedly non-simultaneous lightning bolts of Einstein. They're indeed simultaneous because they're part of this global organic motion, similar to the rose, similar to the tree, same thing. So it cannot be explained, this notion of force, to explain the transition of cube one to cube two. That is, it cannot explain the motion or transformation of the universal field, which is to say, time. Now, I note, attributing to acceleration the status of an absolute force, this is exactly what Einstein did in the thought experiment foundation, that is the elevator of general relativity. It's just one of the problems of general relativity relativity start. But as Bergson stated in time and free will, it is in vain then that we seek to found the reality of motion on a cause, i.e. a force, which is distinct from it. Analysis always brings us back to motion itself. Sabina is mixing together, gluing, confusing the two forms of force. The first, that of physics, which is mathematical, is purely relative, a form of mathematical, supposedly causal determination. It has the determination inherent in mathematical logic. And secondly, the dynamic force we consciously experience. These two are being glued together. That dynamic force, I have an idea of an action. I initiate the action. Throughout the act, an accompanied feeling of effort or force, as Bergson was noted in Time and Free Will. From my idea to act, this is experienced as a continuous whole. And by this very wholeness, the act feels prefigured in the idea as a cause. That is, all is sourced in reality in, in the indivisible organic motion from the inextensive to extended of the universal field. We'll talk about that inextensive to extend in a second. It's this illicit mixture that gives her concept of force from physics the nature of a cause, and thus the seeming coherence of her argument that all billiard balls, each state is caused by the next, by the next, by the next, and it's all determined. In other words, it's an ontology which her concept of force does not possess, which physics does not possess being surreptitiously borrowed from conscious experience. Sabina's box is a special case, an ideal limit. The becoming of the universe proceeds, as Bergson argued, from the inextensive consciousness 
to the extensive, to the field of matter, the world of matter, the extended world, where this motion this from the inner to the extended world is a lessening, a relaxing of the inextensive, why of the negative. A paradigm vision on the human side, as Bergson noted, the intense creative order in that fifth symphony of, of uh, Beethoven in the conscious mind being unfolded in the uh, role of matter in terms of nice discrete notes. And this world of matter, the extended, the extensive, it can be treated only practically, only usefully in terms of the geometric relations of inert solids, like the billiard balls. And then, of course, in the framework of the classic metaphysic where it all fits. But this is an ideal limit. It's never actually reached in that motion from the inextensive to the extended. It's, it gets there enough for practical use. Sabina's entire theory presumes this abstraction, this ideal limit, an abstract framework with no ontological force, as though it does indeed have an ontology. The, the AI or computer model mind embodiment of this no free will argument, same thing, based in this abstraction with no ontological force. Now this is a paste unfolding. This is duration in Bergson's terms. It takes time to unfold things. Time is the unfolding, the development. The water, the water in the glass, the sugar, these are integral participants of this becoming, this motion of the universal field. It's not an isolated system. This is why we have to wait for the sugar to dissolve. The math relations, the equations, expressing only ends of intervals, this ends of flows, do not capture, do not care about the pace. But the universe does care. Time is the motion. Time, is the pace unfolding, is a force. The weight, an index of the freedom of creation. So we can see two components in this pace unfolding. The motion from the inextensive to the extended. This generating the material world or field in the forms of creation. And two, the motion or transformation of this field itself, which is indivisible, where there are no discrete states or instants, where objects and their motions, for example, the billiard balls in motion, are in reality changes or trances of state within the global motion of this whole, as the waves in, in an ocean. Note, we are being are integrally part of this proceeding from the inextensive to the extensive world. We're integrally participating in the force of this dynamic becoming. This is the source of our free action. And to note something I'm neglecting with respect to the Bergsonian notion of time, where the action is the expression not of just the preceding state, but of the entirety of the preceding states, that is of the indivisible organic history slash flow of our being. This extending across the universe as a whole. So this, this force from the inextensive to the extensive, this underlies how we will to lift our finger. It's the basis of voluntary action, how images drive action. And it will be the basis for our understanding the gurus, Baba Lokanath, Ananda Mahima, etc. That is beings who are indissolubly one with this flow from the inextensive to the inextensive, that is integrally part of this universal becoming, the force behind it. So time and free will, matter and memory and creative evolution, they're one vast, vast dissertation on free will, which is to say on the freedom of the creative becoming of the universe in which we participate. Sabina, Sam Harris, Dennett, etc., the little square. So certain they would not look outside it. The difference between them and the Bergson, enormous. So next, I think we'll be talking about Julian Barber and his notion of time, probably. Till then, signing off. <laughs>